This is the Inside Jerry's Brain Call for Friday, January 4th, 2019, the first IJB call of 2019, and a call that presupposes my mortality, which I think is a, is a reasonable assumption. Um, but the question is, what happens to my brain when I am no longer here to shepherd it, feed it, curate it, worry about it, make sure it stays up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's a question provoked because April and I have been uh, working on our wills and, and it turns out the only major asset I have is this, this thing I've done pouring data into somebody else's software. Um, Dave, you and Pete and April uh, are all really familiar with me and my brain. So I don't know that until other people show up who don't have the background, I don't need to explain kind of uh, the nature of the company and the product and what I've done with it. Um, I will do a little screen sharing uh, because I set up a couple questions in of course, my brain. Um, <clears throat> so I set up a couple questions that I'll try to answer as we just to open the call, and uh, and then see where that takes us. So uh, this thought over here, basically, for every Inside Jerry's Brain episode, including all episodes of Yitan and Rex calls and other things that I've done, I create a, a thought in my brain. So I've I've created. And, and here you'll see these thoughts already have a YouTube link associated with them because these are older calls that I've posted to YouTube. And then I put the link in here. So I've created a thought for this call, which uh, later will will include the link to YouTube. Um, hey, Jane, welcome to the call. <clears throat> and um, so I created a thought about, you know, my, uh, my brain in my will. And uh, uh, I can answer a couple of questions kind of right off the bat. Um, uh, for example, do I want other people to uh, improve the brain? Do I want to keep a version of my brain public? Do I want to, to, to be open, et cetera, et cetera? Those things are pretty, um, actually pretty easy for me to, to answer. So I'll, I'll, I'll start off with that. Um, I would love to maintain open access to my brain data as long as possible. I'd be thrilled. Um, <clears throat> I, in fact, I wish that there was an API so that today people could, you know, poke at it, uh, query it, analyze it, do whatever, uh, so that I could you know, uh, throw some AI at it and add metadata and do other kinds of things that would be interesting, but that does not exist right now. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm really interested in uh, the brain as, as it stands being available forever. And I think it's very, very easy to envision uh, that a snapshot of the brain as I had it on the day I left this mortal plane in this bag of meat and water, um, that, there, that a snapshot of that can remain someplace. Uh, so the question becomes, how is it hosted? How does it stay up, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really easy to fork this thing so that there's a snapshot of the last thing I did to it. And uh, as of that day, anybody can still visit it and that can stay in you know, whatever perpetuity means, but that can stay up forever. And then uh, I think the interesting question then is, okay, great, so there's a whole bunch of data are there other uses? Should someone else, might someone else be inspired to pick up where I left off and keep going? Uh, is this uh, an asset to other projects? You know, other, other kinds of things. So the questions, I, <clears throat> the questions I kind of put here spin out of that. Like first, how do I keep my brain data accessible as long as is possible or practical? Uh, the, the one bright spot right now is that the brain software knows how to export itself to XML. And uh, actually, when I gave a talk at the Quantified Self Conference here in Portland a couple of months ago, one of the people who's quite the hacker came up afterward <clears throat> and he said, hey, I, you know, I'd be happy to try exporting your brain. I haven't given him a copy of it to, to run the export or something like that. I should just do that because that would be interesting to do. Um, so th that's very doable. And I think there's a whole bunch of other questions about how do I fund, who is the host, uh, I run into some questions from the Long Now Foundation, right? And the, the clock of the Long Now, how do we make a clock that, that, that ticks every 100 years, that rings every 1,000 years sort of thing? Um, the, the second question that I've been sort of opening up here is who might pick up where I left off? Uh, if nobody wants to, I would understand that because it's sort of complicated. But if somebody wanted to use my brain as a starter, as a sourdough starter and go from there and build on it, that would be really interesting. They might want to meld it with their own project. They might want to, uh, a group of people might want to curate together. I don't really know. I think that's an interesting, interesting question. Um, I'm wondering 
what larger thing might my brain feed? Might I, might what I've created be a starter for some other, other project? Uh, could it be fed to Google's knowledge graph? Uh, could it be something sort of vastly different? Could it lead to the first evil artificial intelligence because it can infer bad intent from everything I'm doing? And, uh, and then we're all doomed because I, I actually made my brain openly available. So I, I doubt that's gonna happen. Uh, and I wanted to make room <clears throat> for us to brainstorm a little bit. What is the wackiest thing that we can imagine happening to my brain? What, what you know, I haven't, I haven't gone into this territory really. I haven't thought about uh, brain post me. I haven't thought about its usability in other contexts that much. I mean, a little bit in the sense that I'm talking about right now, like, you know, DeepMind or Google's Knowledge Graph or other kinds of things. But I don't, uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, where it all uh, would go, should go, could go in those senses. So I'm going to stop the screen share for a second and, uh, and uh, come back into our chat and see what anybody else uh, starts thinking. I've got a couple of thoughts. Please, Pete. Um, I, I uh, have what might sound a bit contrarian, uh, a con kind of contrarian idea, which is that um, my guess is, actually, now that I think about it, maybe two things. Um, the, the nodes are interesting, but uh, I think uh, even more interesting than that is the connections between nodes that you've got. So, uh, that that and the combination of kind of the curation of what what nodes were interesting to you, um, you know, maybe over time, how did that evolve? Um, so I think that's that's there's there's kind of the content of of the nodes, um, but then there's the connectivity of the nodes, um, which I think is actually kind of more important. And then there's another thing, which is the way that you interact with um, the the whole system, right? So the, the interesting thing to me, the, the thing that I would want to see if I were um, your great, great, great grandchild um, or, you know, a historian uh, a couple hundred years hence, uh, I'd want to kind of see the thing in context. Um, how did Jerry use it? Uh, what, what was he thinking as he traversed through things? Um, what did other people think of this? How did this compare with, how did the, the interconnectivity of, of that much information um, how did that, how did that, uh, how did other people, um, react to that? So the things, um, I, I think, you know, we'll kind of come back to just digital preservation stuff. Um, and I, I looked this morning, uh, it looks like now they do JSON, um, as well as XML. Oh, I didn't know. Um, so, uh, uh, I think digital preservation is important and, and kind of, you know, fairly obvious. Uh, the, the things that, the, the things that I would be interested in are things like um, maybe some articles about what you're thinking as you go through the um, as you go through the process of using the brain, what you've found other people's reactions to it are. Um, just lots and lots and lots and lots of videos of you just you know uh, three minute videos of a tour you know uh, kind of James Burkish you know here's a connection that I I you know I know that you know I know that probably nobody else has made um, that kind of following that path. Uh, and then I think also um, you interacting with other people. So this is, you know, the IJB, IJB series is a great, you know, it's going to be a great artifact. What did other people think of the brain? Um, when you show it to them, what do they think? When you give them a tour through it, what do they think? How do they react? I think, I think also um, going into the future, that's going to be the way the, the, the highest way kind of to maintain preservation of it is not so much just the data, but if you can mentor up other people to do something similar or mentor up other people to do something maybe a little bit different, but be inspired by you. Uh, somebody who's 20 years your junior, 40 years your junior, um, or a couple of somebodies um, who can give somebody a tour to their kids or you know, their intellectual kids, at least, um, in 60 years or 80 years or something like that, that that would be probably a, a better way um, and, and a more practical way kind of to continue the, you know, the, the thread of it. Um, and can you, you said that this was probably two ideas. Can you separate out the two ideas that you were thinking yes. about? Um, uh, and, and I'll make it three. Uh, content, which is, uh, 
susceptible to digital preservation. Then connectivity um, and curation, uh, which is kind of one thing for me clumped together. Uh, so, and, and it's something that I think is not going to be obviously maintained in a digital preservation um, uh, just you know, just a XML representation or a JSON representation of the nodes doesn't replicate the UI of the brain, and you kind of lean into the UI, and you've got a, a superstructure UI built on top of it that you do just in practice. So, mm -hmm. um, part of the preservation, long-term preservation, needs to be not only just the the data, but the use of it, um, how it how it's in action. So those are two things: uh, content, connectivity. Um, and then the third one is culture. Um, I think, I, I think uh, if I were you, I'd you know spend the next ten or fifteen years of my life building culture around my my little digital artifact um, and the, and the connectivity around it. And the culture is really, I think, going to be the thing that's that's interesting to you know, the, the future of humanity and and the future of AIs wherever that they go. Um, many things I haven't thought about, like I, M Michael and Kevin, welcome to the call. Thanks for being here. Um, many things I haven't thought about, Pete, thank you. Uh, one of them is the idea of mentoring somebody to sort of tend this thing. Um, hadn't occurred to me. It's a great idea. Um, it's, it, it's very funny because you, you've said a couple times, how do other people react to it? And there's this really wide spectrum of reactions. On the one hand, other people trying the brain bounce off it a lot. Like the brain has a real problem with uptake, <clears throat> right? People don't, don't stick on it. They don't groove the habit. Even people who really like it uh, uninstall it 10 times or annually as Gene does. Um, uh, it, it doesn't sort of stick necessarily and it can look pretty daunting to people. Then at the same time, I, I, I was standing in front of, you know, 200 people at the Quantified Self uh, Summit and they gave me some time at the end and I had this, the, you know, the brain big on screen behind me and I was busy talking through what I'd seen at the thing. Everybody was leaning in, completely enthusiastic. They absolutely got it. Like they were, they were completely on board, excited. And they were like, damn, this is, this is like Quantified, this is Qualified Self, I don't know what it is. But they, they really got it. And that takes me to another thought I've never thought of, which is that the metadata that the brain is actually capturing um, is actually quite useful. So the, the brain knows anytime I've modified a thought, when I've put, you know, the brain is time stamping a lot of actions, which is good, which a, which a pure JSON or XML pour out might not preserve, right? Don't know what actually gets poured out other than thought names, link names, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it'd be interesting to know how deep, um, how deep the export would go. And then of course, anytime I do an export from that moment on, anything I add to my current brain is out of sync with whatever else happened, blah, 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 blah. It gets really complicated there. Uh, and then the last thing you said about culture, I'd love to go back into um, because I, part of what this is all about is sort of a, a, a spirit of inquiry and collaborative sense-making, right? The collaborative sense-making is one of the like, favored phrases for me in, in, the, in this whole space. And the brain that I'm using doesn't lend itself well to collaboration. Right now I'm using it as exhibit A, but it's not like we're all busy editing our brains and, and, and sharing them together in this space. <clears throat> and that's, those are maybe several different kinds of culture. But I am, I am really interested, and have never voiced it this way, in sparking a culture of, of inquiry, curiosity, uh, memory, sort of uh, thoughtful memory so that we're not asking and answering the same questions over and over again and being spun by other people. I think that's, that's hugely important to me uh, in the middle. Let me go to Gene who's raised his hand and then back to this question of culture. Go ahead, Gene. Culture was, was one of my questions because I'm not sure I understood what Peter meant about spending the next 10 or 15 years developing culture. And before I give Peter a chance to answer or elaborate on that, I've, I've wandered around in your brain several times, probably numerous times. And, and I find this is what Jerry connected to this and this is what he connected to this. But what I don't seem to find is what did Jerry think? There, um, there, aren't, any, there aren't any notes in there that tell me what you were thinking when you put all this stuff together. Hmm. 
Um, so oh, unless, unless I just missed them. Okay. So I, I, I use thought names as editorial comments a lot. So I have skeptical of, I have critiques of, I have, uh, I have my beliefs, of course, which is what I believe, right? So that, that kind of trickles down through. I don't necessarily try to editorialize in the notes field, for example, right? So, so I, think, I think a lot of my point of view needs to be inferred. Does that make sense? It might be a leap too far. It, it, may, it may well be. It may be incomprehensible. I'd, I'd be curious if other people who've browsed my brain have a similar question about like, where am I and what am I thinking? Kevin, go ahead. You're muted. Uh, I can unmute you. Hold on. You are now no, not, not muted. All right. I uh, didn't realize that I uh, hadn't hit that control. So when I have experienced the brain as an optimal experience, like a chick sense mahai optimal experience where the aha is coming through, is when you are curating a journey through it. It is not through self-exploration. Um, now, while it's probably a good repository and artifact for someone who might be doing research and wants to see connections for ideas, it comes alive when you use it. It does not come alive when others use it in the same way because it is a representation of you know when you put the link in, you know why it connected to other thoughts, and so the narrative comes from you, not from the brain. Which, so this is a really good argument for me living forever. Well, or um, that your videotape narratives of journeys through the brain are showing people particular stories, use cases, right? Um, you know, where they could replicate their own. They said, well, now I'm using Jerry's brain to tell you something that I want to say um, because you've provided it by example. And relative to the comments that I gave you online yesterday, which I won't bother to unpack. You saw those, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. I'm in fact, I've is, got them open. You, you need to be able to, to say, do I want this to be living so that after I die, other people continue to add to this space and continue to make it more and more robust, or does it freeze at the moment you die and it is a representation of what you were thinking during your lifetime? They're both legitimate and it's not either or, but there are two different paths and two different intentions that you need to express in terms of what do you want you know, done with what you have created, because this is a digital inheritance mm -hmm. that you've created and you need to express intention about what gets done with it. So just before you and Michael climbed on the call, um, I did say uh, it's really easy for me to imagine a forking where there's a snapshot of the last time I touched the brain that that gets preserved in aspect somewhere and is always visible <clears throat> as the last version that, that I touched. And I would love for that to exist, that that's important to me to exist somehow. And then that, that data gets exported, that brain gets you know, sent to other people, that brain gets published openly, and, and 5,000 people around the world decide to pick it up and go try something, and two of them stay with it for a couple of years. I don't know. I mean, I'm interested in all these scenarios, where, and, and, and that could go lots of different directions. So I'm, I'm interested in both. So I, I will leave you with this thought, then I'll go back into listen mode, is that if we were to take a technology like the Tanjo machine learning and create a version, an interest graph version of Jerry and what he's interested in, and you have the brain object sitting here, and then you have the semantic web sitting on the other side, which is constantly changing, what you do when I talk to you is you say, oh, you see what happened today? Let me show you something over here in the brain, all right? If I had a dip digital representation of your interests, a, a digital Jerry, things that are happening in the real moment would then trigger references over to the brain, right, which would give you a dynamic ongoing environment, similar to what Asimov wrote about in the Foundation series with Harry Seldon as the, you know, you know the, the digital self that comes back right, and gives guidance later, 
right, at certain points in, as a psychohistorian in certain points in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, to Michael and then uh, April. Um, yes, of course, all good points. Thank you, Kevin, Peter. Um, Jerry, your brain's great. It's terrific, hallelujah. But it's just a brain, you know, it's just one. What is particularly relevant is your braining. Mm -hmm. It's like um, if somebody invented music, somebody's got to play the bloody stuff. And maybe the guy who invented the harpsichord had hammer fists of some sort. You know, like you know, if you can't play the gig, it's not it's not communicating. Now, what I find most relevant about your exploration, your work, your product, is your process of doing it and using this tool as the medium. Mm -hmm. So, so the idea of mentoring, not so much mentoring your material and your content, although that would obviously be the feedstock and all sorts of stuff, um, very valuable, mm -hmm. but you need to clone uh, people who can play Jerry um, in their way. It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's, it's just like learning a new instrument. So definitely mentorship, bring them in. I, I agree. And, and uh, in 10 or 20 years, you'll, you'll also have AI players that, that will be able to play like James Burke or like Jerry Mikulski. Or... Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what would actually a really, a really interesting uh, possible future is where I train an AI to pick up and be, be me in the tour guide sense and in the curator sense. Right? And I think the way to do that is, is lots of videos of you explaining it to another human. Um, so, uh, you know, so a, an AI of 20 years hence will be able to kind of have a map of all of the stuff in your brain and then watch you make the connections through it. Um, kind of, I, people do this too, you know, they watch you um, braining, um, it's a, a great term. Um, and they, they can see it. I, I've used this metaphor before with you, Jerry, of, of you playing, you know, stepping up to an instrument and, and playing like you're a concert pianist. Um, and other people respond to that emotionally and can see what's going on and can understand what's going on, but that doesn't mean that they rec can replicate it. But I, the, that being able to play the music and, and hearing music so in a sense, you've kind of innovated, uh, you know, it's like the brain is like a new, a new piano and mm -hmm. you've figured out how to become a, a, a concert pianist on it. And that, the, that, you know, leap or that practice is kind of the thing to inculcate other people with. If, if I may, um, yeah. uh, I, I think mentoring other people for me and what I would imagine happening, you know, 100 or 200 years hence, it's going to be, um, uh, what I would do is try to train, you know, multiple people, you know, this is what I'm doing. I think the people who will catch on aren't necessarily, you, you don't want to mentor them into being the brain um, experts. Um, and you don't even need actually for them to be able to replicate what you do, but being able to explain what you're doing. Uh, so, you know, somebody who can say, okay, now he's, he's using his hands in a different way. The keys he has to hit are different. Um, or he's changing, you know, look, here's a chord and here's a chord. And you, did you see the progression that he did between them? Um, so uh, a historian hundred years from now should be able to say, you know, here's Tiddlywiki um, and here's somebody who used it really well. Uh, here's C2, um, the C2 wiki and what they were doing with it. Um, mm -hmm. Here's Jerry Mikulski mm -hmm. and the way he used the brain. Um, and somebody, somebody giving a tour through it, you know, will be able to kind of uh, uh, analyze and, and explain what was going on as you make connections. And that's kind of what you want to preserve. So, yeah, so I just watched this, I think it was a Vox video about uh, Coltrane's giant changes, Coltrane's giant steps, right? And um, I, I don't know any music theory. I can't play an instrument. Um, I found it riveting. It was fascinating. <clears throat> it was super interesting. And, and I think it's sort of like what you're talking about here. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, but you should go back to the origins of jazz as a music form. Right. Because <laughs> that's the most analogous to what's going on here. 
Yeah. Yes, and and so I think of I think of some of what I do as a performance art or improv, right? So the couple times I've been able to have a brain performance with an audience, the most recent being that quantified self thing that just happened. Um, I, I very much think of it as a combination of improv because I'm taking cues from the audience, like what are you interested in, what where, where do you want to go, and performance art in the sense that this is digital perform. I mean, <clears throat> maybe one what a really interesting I, sh I should do is I should I should connect to some of the people I know who curate performance art or, or digital art of different kinds and see what they say and see if we can't set up something with them because I, th I think that's mm -hmm. a that's a super interesting. Uh, venue, format, channel, environment that I have not explored whatsoever. Um, and I've, I've found most digital art to be difficult. I, I, haven't, I haven't hit that much digital art that I look at and go, that I need to do, in, you know, uh, be, use, inhabit, anything like that. Um, let me, let me uh, unmute April for a second because she wanted to step into the conversation and she's on her phone. There we go. April, go ahead. Hi, everyone. And uh, sorry, I'm not on video, but glad to join this call. And these are wonderful, wonderful suggestions. Um, Jerry, real quick, you might talk to Drew Katayoka, mm -hmm. who is very much in the digital art world and could have some interesting ideas. Um, but first, and this is where I think the pragmatic uh, part of me and the lawyer in me and all of this just wants to put in a word really quick. Um, and then we can go back to being super generative and creative and all of that. Um, Jerry mentioned that we're trying to do our wills. Um, there, there's kind of a different kind of fork here that I see. Um, one of which is, and it's again, very practical, but I think it's helpful as you, you know, transcribe these notes, as you think about what happens moving forward. The part about the will is actually highly legalistic, but also it's like what has to happen versus or I would say your request for what has to happen versus what you'd like to see happen. And none of that actually belongs in a will. Um, so I just, I call that out because I prefer the like, let's blow the lid off of what all of this could be. But at the end of the day, it could easily be in the will, just a couple of lines where, and again, this is maybe a different avenue, but, We've talked about possibly having a bo effectively a board of trustees, people with to whom you would entrust ongoing, the ongoing life of the brain along the lines of what we're talking about here. But that would simply be your request. You wouldn't put anything like, I must have a um, group of, what do you call it, um, brainers, or that it's not about uh, obligating others to, to do something. It's about, there's a separate conversation that I think a lot of this call is about, which is beyond the will, which is totally fine. I just kind of want to call that out because the will at the end of the day, isn't most of what we're talking about right now. And that's fine. But what I like is that the will itself may end up being just a very simple provision in which and again, I don't know if it's a, it feels to me like there is maybe a consortium of, uh, of people who understand what this legacy ought to be that get listed as, you know, or, or whatever. Anyway, let me pause there, but just kind of coming back to some of the more foundational framing of not just this call, but your goals for the brain. And, and you didn't say it, and I thought you were going, going to go there as well, but like, are there legal protections or copyrights or other sorts of things that I should or, or ought to do so that somebody doesn't somehow waylay the whole thing? I mean, well, this is where yes and no. I mean, right now, the only and it, sorry if this is a little bit wonky, but the only parties to what's going on right now are you and the brain software team. So long as somebody doesn't hack your brain or, or do something really nefarious, which I think is highly unlikely. Um, it's just the two of, it's just you guys. So, you know, would you, would you want to make sure in advance that you agree and notify the brain team that your expectation is that, you know, given the contribution you've made to them and the world and all the rest, that they would ensure that your brain remain active. And I hate to say it, but so long as the brain software remains active, because mm -hmm. there's always the likely the possibility that in the future, they're not there and if they're not there within your brain's not there um or that you would be migrated somehow but that would be something that you would contract with them 
not that contract doesn't show up in the will, but it does, you would make a reference to um, the brain software people. And right. then anyone else that you would bring in as maybe a curator or a trustee or something like that, um, quite candidly, you can do that after you sign the will. You just basically say uh, you would make an addendum to it at a later time where you spell out who is on the board of trustees kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is getting really wonky, but I love mm. that it, for me, it's been fascinating because when you think about it as not just as a lawyer, and your wife, but like for in terms of intellectual property and for me, and this is more for the broader group, what you, what we're really starting to touch upon. And I think those of you on the call who know me know that I spend time on the you know, sharing economy and access over ownership and are we heading to the, a world of no ownership, this, that, and the other. Wills are a lot about one's legacy and more and more, especially as we look at digital assets and what one's digital legacy is, this has massive implications. I feel like we're kind of today on the tip of the sphere for what a lot of people are going to have to be thinking about in the future where it's not like, okay, I have, and I hate to say it, put it so bluntly, but like in the past, it's like, okay, I have two houses and three cars and a boat and like all this stuff. And here's how I'm going to bequeath it we're clearly moving towards a world in which that is less common, but digital assets and digital legacies are more common. And there's not really a set of best practices or principles that I'm aware of for how you think about such things in the context of um, trusts and estates and wills and all of that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it does feel like that we're sort of stepping into this whole notion of digital leg legacies, which is a really, um, a really nascent, uh, nascent field. Um, Dr. Witzel, you've raised your hand. Um, yeah, uh, that, that, that was really helpful, uh, uh, April. I, I was, when I saw the note about the call, I got excited because the two, two meta things, if you will, uh, indulge. One is, it does feel to me like you're asking a fairly universal question for any kind of organization that has uh, a depreciating asset, I suppose, right? I mean, it, somehow, if you want it to, to exist into perpetuity, it has to be funded and maintained. And how do you do that? And so... You know, I think there's a there's a broader uh, discussion around strategies for main, maintaining this asset. So, you know, and, and I was, you know, look at Linux. How how is it that Linux is going to, you know, exist into the future? Mm -hmm. um, and um, so there's one that I just think that you've got a general a specific case of a general problem, and then um, second um, that this format of doing a consultation around a problem like this, I think, is really interesting. And I'd like to hit you up about doing another one. So, um, I've got uh, a guy that knows how to replicate coral and he wants business process advice. And I was thinking this would be a good format. Sounds awesome. Um, I'd love to do that. I mean, on the Inside Jerry's Brain website, there's a little section that says, let me do this for your company. <clears throat> and, and there's actually a, a, a fee schedule because I, I, I would love to, to, to you know, gnaw on a problem. And the fee schedule basically says, if you wanna do it openly and you're willing to have the conversation be published and you know, live streamed or whatever, it's free or close to free. And if you're, you, know, you can pay for privacy kind of thing. But, but that, that's something I'm, I'm actually super interested in. Yeah, and I see the note, the note about a depreciating asset. And I don't know if it necessarily, it, to me it's, it's any, if it doesn't depreciate, if it, if it doesn't decay, mm -hmm. then it's not as big a problem. You know, I mean, flat flat HTML pages are probably easier than anything that has a database, for example. But I think I think anything any, anything that needs to be kept up to date uh, depreciates when nobody's keeping it up to date. The the yeah. moment somebody stops maintaining it, it go it starts diving. Uh, it's not really depreciating; it's appreciating as long as people are curating it, um, and it's just getting more and more valuable as it gets better connected. Unless uh, getting better connected also leads to a deterioration of the sense-making capacity of the thing. Like one thing I worried about, you know, in using the brain was, would it just get too messy? And it hasn't. It, I mean, to this point, it, it, it didn't take that particular um, path. But it's funny to think of it in terms of, uh, um, you know, passing stuff down. Is, is the brain gonna, in some sense going to be like your grandmother's China, which like nobody wants grandma's China anymore. You know what? I, we have we have an old silver tea set that that like nobody wants tea sets. It's like weird. You might as well melt it down for the silver, which doesn't doesn't you know go for much. But yeah, so it's, it's, you know, there's a question of value. You have to you know, it, it's it's worth passing down to someone and, and having them be the custodian to the extent that there is some value that they feel. And, and the so value. How do you create defined value? 
Yeah, and the value question brings up a, a separate thread that I've been on here on these calls, which is why does nobody give a damn that we have no memory? Like, like I'm, I'm still completely frustrated that very few people seem to care that we have no collective memory, that, that we don't get tools for making memory, that everything is flow and you know, we're busy being spun in the middle of the stream. We're like little boats tossing in the great info ocean. And it's like, well, I guess that's the way it's gotta be. Well, and I stuck a link into, I think this is the one I was thinking long ago, but Steven Johnson's note-taking tools and his, mm -hmm. you know, his background stuff, which is interesting. But you know, he doesn't try to publish his note-taking tools. He publishes the books. It's an intermediate product. And right. it could be that it would be really interesting to have access to Steven Johnson's notes. I, I don't know, but I don't think they're public. And, and I don't think that's the product he's talking about. He's talking about the, the books that come out of it. And I wonder if you're in a similar situation where the, you know, the videos or some, or your books are going to be the product of the brain. The brain is simply, you know, it, you know, it was, it was an intermediate product that doesn't ever have a life. Itself. Yeah. Um, let me just screen share for a second. Cause I've got his essay from when he, when he originally published it, uh, not on medium. So I think he republished, he reposted it because I've got tool for thought, which has a different URL here. And he's a big, big fan of Devon Think. Um, so I should actually put, given what I do these days, I would put the reference to it under the tool. Um, and I should link this article up a little bit more, but here's, uh, here's Steven. And uh, got a whole bunch, whole bunch of stuff on him. He's represented by the Lee Bureau. Uh, he wrote Mind Wide Open. He wrote The Invention of Air. Uh, how we got to now and his latest book, Farsighted. And I went to listen to a book talk he did here in Portland, actually in Hillsboro. And we got to hang out for a little while um, uh, around, around it. it was very nice. Um, somebody was just, uh, Gene, you were raising your hand. You are I muted. To, I, yeah, I have to remember where, where to unmute me. It's not on my image. Um, the, the comment about having a collective m memory, I mean, we don't know we need one until we need one, and then we don't have it, and, and then you can't create it. Right. And, they, and any, when, when I'm interested in discussing with numerous people a subject, because I'm extremely ignorant about the subject and I would like a lot like or benefit from a number of additional perspectives. Discussion groups suck. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're essentially a garbage dump. Um, and, you know, for a long time, I have looked for a way to, to facilitate a multi-threaded discussion that makes sense where you can in fact create a collective memory about the discussion of this topic that goes on so that you start with a thought and then you have two thoughts and then you have seven thoughts and then there are 25 thoughts and there's 25 discussions going on at one time. Mm -hmm. And I have participated in a number of um, consortiums where the, the people that were initially part of the consortium developed ideas and they progressed and the people that were there at the beginning understood the progression. And a year later, when half of the people changed, you couldn't make progress anymore because you spent the next six months bringing all the new people up to speed on what right. you talked about the first year. And, and the question was, how do you get over this? Okay. And, and the brain would make a marvelous archive for this, but you can't have 50 people involved in discussions in the brain because it's just too damn expensive. All right. So, so I was having a discussion one day with a few people and all of a sudden I had this brain fart and I developed this mm -hmm. thing in Kumu, which is a way to have a multi-threaded discussion and, and piece it all together on the fly as it evolves and distill it and um, in, in Kumu? Yes. So, Michael, would you, you already watched the video. Would you say a couple of words about what you thought when you watched the video? 
Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, th I thought it was excellent because um, it gave um, pattern and thread. It allowed you to annotate and the notes could stay um, accessible. Um, um, I, it seemed like a, a very practical approach to um, some quick memory of a, a conversation in an effective way. So the, the idea was that, that I posted a link to the video that I did about the, the Kumu project, and I just posted a link to the Kumu project itself. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that, that you can develop a discussion on any element that you create in Kumu, whether it's an element or a connection or a loop designation, you can have a discussion about it. And as the discussion progresses, someone can be responsible for that particular thread and they can distill the content of the thread back to the top so that if some, well, wait a minute, why don't I just share the screen instead of doing this? Uh, yes, let me let go of the screen for a second. I'm adding your video to my brain under you. Here you are. It's a sort of distributed yeah. curation process. It, it, it looks very, uh, very um, usable. Hold on, and I'll let go of the screen right about now. Go ahead, Gene. So, I put this together in about 30 minutes. So, it, I mean, it, the topics aren't anything relevant, but the idea was that, that I can create topics and I can initiate a, a discussion on that topic and anybody with a Kumu username and password can participate in the discussion and, and it's all free. And as the discussion evolves, I can go ahead and take the, the meaningful elements of that discussion and I can go ahead and distill them back to the text or the description of that particular element. And I can then fork it to create other elements and create discussions on them and, and create connections between them to give someone a sense of how they relate, if they relate. And I just, just you know, figured we have active pending and concluded so that that the ones that are concluded, we already talked about and we came to a resolution on and, and here's the collective perspective on those. And here are the ones that we're currently talking about and this one we haven't started talking about yet. But if I just go ahead and create, oh, I'm not even logged in. If I just go ahead and create a new element, the idea was that somebody is responsible for that particular discussion thread and and as to when it was started or when it ended and you know you can put whatever on, on it you want but you can go ahead and say okay here's another piece mm -hmm. all right and then and then simply say okay i want to start a discussion on this create the issue and then it goes ahead and actually puts an asterisk on that element to say that there is a discussion associated with it. So, yeah. It's so also, this, this, is, this also points to the need for modularity and interoperability between things like discourse and things like the brain and Kumu because, uh, or Evernote, for example. So <clears throat> I don't put a lot in the notes field in, in my brain because I just know it's gonna make my brain file gigantic and probably cause problems but I use Evernote all the time for, for note taking. So what if the notes field in the brain could be Evernote? So what if the discussions you're putting in here could have the sophistication? Because discourse is actually really a, a very nice uh, threaded conversation engine with lots and lots of features. So what if instead of just a notes field in Kumu software, you were linking to uh, a discussion that was on a different platform, but was, but was perfectly happy looking embedded here where you're showing us in, in Kumu? You, you, well, what was the platform you were talking about? Discourse. Which is not discuss. Okay. Uh, there's there's several. There's, yeah. it's, it's discourse. 
Yeah, there's several. There's a whole bu a whole bucket of these, okay. but I think I think the one I like best right now is discourse. But uh, you know, there's okay. there's also I've got uh, a quick suggestion I, for, yeah. for for that. Um, uh, generate a unique ID and drop it in your different tools as you go. So just go to the threads in discourse. And, and assume that somebody in 10 or 20 years is going to find your, your breadcrumb trail. Right. And so, the, the other, the other <clears throat> truism about uh, interoperability is that we don't really understand the, the schema behind Discourse or Kumu or there's, there's a, it's, the, the schemas are, are difficult to kind of instantiate and they're not completely reflected in the, the technology. Mm -hmm. So they don't map. You know, so it, it doesn't make sense yet. So right now, the best we might do is find a permalink somewhere in the tool to a piece of the conversation, drop it in our tool, and cross fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so but, let me go. But, uh, the yeah, last thing. thought on that on that project, yeah. you know, I'll, it's a public project, which means anybody can go there and fork a copy of it. Fork is the programmer term for clone, um, and make a copy of it that belongs to them so that they can use it as a template for evolving it to whatever they might find useful. So, very cool. Thank you. Um, Excellent. Uh, let me go over to the what is the wackiest thing that might happen kind of question just to play with that for, for a little bit. Um, it's funny because when you start talking about the culture aspects of this, Pete. And I, I, my, my brain went to the culture series, uh, Ian Banks uh, sci-fi novels and how uh, there's, a, there's a, an entire galactic civilization known as the culture uh, that has particular ways, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, that's interesting. Um, can you say, for, before we go to other sort of streams, can you say a little bit more about the, the how you imagine this this cultural aspect of of using a uh, sense making tool would pl might play out uh, you're muted mm, still there we um, go. how it plays out into the future yeah um let me let me tell I the best way I can do this is maybe tell a story. Um, it's about my brother, uh, who's a high school teacher, a um, couple of different various subjects. Uh, but uh, he noticed in the past five years or so that that child that kids high school kids are are not learning to write anymore. Um, so he realized he was on this precipice of of change where everybody wrote everything and nobody writes anything, um, and he kind of wanted to document that. Uh, so he, he dove into the history of uh, American handwriting, um, learned a ton about it, uh, knows a ton, and he can now tell stories. He can look at different samples of handwriting from, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. He can tell you when it was written, what part of the country it was written in, uh, the, the gender of the writer. Um, uh, he goes into things like uh, library hand, which is a certain kind of uh, uh, script that librarians use to do cat card catalogs. Um, they do a lot of tiny little writing and, you know, it has to look fairly, uh, fairly regular so that different librarians have the same kind of hand. Um, and he goes into uh, Dewey uh, and how some of the, the library hand came out of Dewey and, and his writing with people. Um, so he's, he's got, uh, you know, he's got interest, uh, Edison wrote an, uh, or Edison invented an electric pen, an electric pencil. The idea was it was some kind of vibrating thing or, or electrical thing where you could make a copy of something written by writing it and it would duplicate at the same time it was writing. Um, so my brother has a culture of handwriting um, and he's picked it up from bits and pieces. Uh, there are penmen, uh, penmanship, uh, uh, associations, there are uh, lexicographers, there's uh, ancient manuscript people. He's got these various lobes of interest that kind of coalesce around uh, handwriting that he's he's gone out to each of these communities and learned what they know about the history of handwriting or how to describe the history of handwriting or how to describe 
you know, letters or things like that. Um, and so kind of to come back around to Jerry's brain, what I can imagine in 150 years is somebody like my brother, uh, who's got a passion for the way people used to uh, do information architecture and uh, kind of collaboration and memory and note taking and, you know, a bunch of different things. Um, uh, and they'll have a they'll have uh, stories about uh, the brain and how Jerry Mikulski used it. And, you know, so the, I think, so it, if I look at that as kind of an end point, um, I think what you want to do at this point, um, uh, setting aside your will for a sec, um, mm -hmm. is teaching people to, to jazz, right? Te pe teaching people to brain. And most of the people aren't actually going to be interested in, in braining as much as they're going to be interested in their own little thing. You know, it's either wikiing or um, uh, outlining or whatever. But for those people who are interested in the things that the brain accomplishes for you, who have something, some other, you know, set of tools that they've, they've gone over, probably all of us, um, uh, having them be able to explain what it is, what, what, you're doing, how it's different from the, the thing that they, you know, do whether or not they like it or not. Um, and have this culture of braining and all the things adjacent to it is, is kind of what I'm thinking. Love that. Um, I, may I ask your brother's name? David Kaminsky. Thank you. Now he's under handwriting, how about that? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and you saw that I added um, library hand and an article about it and, and stuff like that. So yeah. It's super cool. And so, about it. Um, so I think Dave, Dave said something interesting to me, which was, you know, uh, assets that have to be maintained um, need funding and maintaining. Um, and that's a completely reasonable thing to say and, and true of, of things like maybe land or cars or um, electric pens. Um, but there's, uh, there's a different kind of preservation, which is cultural preservation. Um, people telling stories to each other over and over and over, right? Or people like my brother finding stories, or um, in his case, he even, and I do, the, I do genealogy, that's my historical thing. Um, I, can, I can pull together things that people in the past had no clue that would ever exist, even. Um, DNA matches and and transcribe censuses in search engines and newspaper archives. In a few seconds, I can put together a story of somebody's life from, you know, 1880 that, you know, was impossible to even imagine that anybody would know, um, you know, uh, 100 to 200 years hence. So, um, uh, so back to culture, I think, so that there's a, I've, I've got a passion about archiving and archivists and uh, historical research, but there's also another thing, which is just people telling each other stories, you know, over and over and over, uh, over the course of, of generations. I, I also wanted to one in, right in this thread is also another thing. Uh, another thing you want to figure out how to inculcate is, um, is uh, ceremonies. Uh, so the long now clock is something that says, you know, well, every, you know, hundred or a thousand years, there's going to be something interesting that happens and we'll wait around for it. Um, laying a cornerstone or, or creating a time capsule or having uh, the, uh, the anniversary the, of um, the great demo uh, are things where people can look back and, and reanimate uh, something that existed from 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. So if you can have a, you know, a Jerry's birthday party celebration in 200 years where somebody pops open the brain, um, and does some kind of VR kind of thing where it's like, okay, imagine Jerry sitting here and the brain is projected on this flat thing, you know, and, and the kids are kind of walking around through the space and, you know, some of them grab the, the nodes on the, the brain and kind of pull them apart. Why was he talking about these things, you know? That's, that's what you want. Love that. And it's, and it's not funding, it's, it's culturing, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I don't, I don't necessarily want to know how much money needs to be put away in perpetuity to pay somebody to do this for that long. I want to know what, what, what actions will cause a bunch of people to want to do this in 200 years. Michael, you've got the floor. 
hands-on. Like, unless there's hands-on, nothing's going to happen. And hands is the thing we keep losing. I noticed how much, you know, Peter is using his hands. We all point, we wave at Mark, you know. But then, where are the hands gone? I don't see any hands anymore. Oh, there's a hand, right? Jerry's hand is up. But otherwise, we're just faces on boxes. And what I found recently is my hands have been sucked into the frame. The machine has got my hands. First it was keyboards, now it's screens. And I'm, I'm beginning to feel a bit like uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex, you know. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's futile and it's not working. And I, I, I'm devastated by your point there, uh, Peter, about your brother's experience with the, the loss of writing which I, I don't write anything anymore. It's an ille illegible, you know? So how, how quickly can an entire culture disappear because we are not hands-on? We're not in the real world with our tactile, bilateral, multifunctional, real-time flow sensory process cooking along. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I love hands and I, I, I make a point to use the frame of video calls to put my hands in and do stuff with them because they're expressive and you can say something and you can hold something and you can, you know, they're, they're fun. So I, mm -hmm. But, but I, I don't see many people doing that. Mostly we're talking heads now. Which is one of the functions of this necessary technology. This technology has enabled us to form these com conversations. But we really need to be having these conversations in the street. You know, this has got, the brain has got to be local, for instance. I want a brain in my home, hometown as a joint project. So I should set up a soapbox on the corner and a projection screen behind me and do brain. Well, design. there should be, brain, there brain should be a, a storefront of some sort in every town, a storefront where you can just wander in and participate in the brain. And, and buskers. Yeah. With a hat and, and change and coffee. Story. And coffee. You know, but basically, the, the, we see the political space has disappeared in my hometown. You know, there is the library and there is the fountain by the intersection, but that's it. Right. But you're not supposed so, to talk in the library, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, it's it not a civic space for discussion, it's a space only for individual research. So, can it's we changing now take these processes down back into the, the social and the community and the present time. Mm -hmm. Gene, go ahead. I watched a very disgusting movie the other day about um, the, uh, the gaming companies paid the government so that the government could provide a guaranteed income to everyone so that they could stay, they could live jacked into their gaming chairs and never leave. And it was a, just a circle, and there was nobody on the streets anymore. Everybody just lived in their gaming chairs. So I've already forgotten the name of the movie because it's not worth watching, but I have no taste in movies. I'm sure we could look it up and find it. Um, what one other thing, wacky like, things might happen I, can here? Can I just flag one, one point here is the yeah. story. We keep talking about how the story is what confirms and is repeatable and has um, communication to the, the next audience and whatever. So it, it, this is about the art of writing the story of the brain. And, and so partly from Gene saying, I can't infer from your brain what you think about these things, your opinion, and from Pete talking about the value of the stories or the narratives or my guided tours, you know, the Cook's tour of why put something in where. Um, I'm starting to, th to think of the, the three minute videos that, that discuss a particular path through any, any sector of this a little bit as hyphae. Um, so, so mycelium is the, the plant, mushroom is the fruiting body. The hyphae are the little tips of, the, of mycelium that are sort of racing out to connect and do things. So the hyphae are sort of the active threads that are weaving across, right? Yeah. Pete, do I have that right? I think so, yeah. And that's, so, that's a good analogy. Yeah, so, and, and this whole thing is very rhiz rhizomic, right? I mean, the, you know, 
the, the, the very much very much about roots and connections and whatever and and frustratingly my brain is only my brain i would love to see where the rhizomal connections are between us and even <clears throat> perhaps more interestingly to to stretch the metaphor a little bit and i might I, I think i showed some of this in one of our previous ijb calls um fungal networks metabolize minerals out of the soil and feed them to trees which cannot metabolize <coughs> those things themselves the trees exchange sugars and stored energy for those minerals with the fun the fungus so there are these wonderful symbiotic underground relationships going on of production and exchange um, <coughs> so that brings me to different roles that we all might play in these shared curated webs of what we know i mean um hold on had to cough in in one of my wildest dreams we start to figure out how to have good governance conversations about how to make collective decisions around things that really matter right so dave around regenerative agriculture and regenerative economy um gene around what do what do we think about how we think and how do we represent that? And where does it go? And who gets to talk about it? Uh, Michael, about currencies and how we, um, how currencies can help us manage resources and connect together back in, you know, and, and keep wealth local and, and all of those kinds of things, like the next conversation we're going to have. And I'm really interested in that happening. So, I mean, to be, to be overly optimistic here for a second, I'm creating Inside Jerry's Brain conversations about these things and we're busy having them and recording them and publishing them. So to, to the smallest fractional extent possible, this is already happening in the world, right? There's, there's like six of us on a, on a Zoom call doing it more or less. Um, if we can lather, rinse, repeat, uh, maybe there's something interesting here. And this may be such a niche edgy thing that only you know 60 people care eventually but but how what would need to happen to this so that six billion people care one, one of the things one of my open questions is given that i know how many people bounce off the brain and how daunting it seems to a lot of people or whatever what could you add to pinterest what one or two gestures or features could you add to pinterest or tumblr or any of those instagram any of those dead simple things where i took a picture i tagged it i posted it what, what simple thing could you add to those tools that would give you 80% of the, of the connective associative mind mappy power of the brain? Could, you know, is, is there an uphill path from a dead simple tool that has a huge audience that gives it some of the semantic richness of what we're, we see in things like the brain? I, I think that's, dredging the wrong mud in a way. Um, I'm, I'm more interested in, in uh, processes that are led by a sort of an, an intelligence and a purpose than that we tap into Instagram and you've just got this mass of metadata starts happening. I mean, one day, sure. But um, I think what will take braining out into a wider utilization is that it's being wider used in good effect. You know, it, it's got to develop its own momentum and uh, process. And um, I, I, I hear your, your Instagram proposition is like, sure, there's a big white market out there, huge com community, but I don't think the hugeness of the community is as important as the, the function and the purpose of the community. Well, I think, you know, parents trying to get their kids to eat broccoli or their veggies. Mm -hmm. um, this, people, will, people will someday realize this is good for them. We should just keep teaching them these, uh, these arcane tools mm -hmm. is, an arg is an argument. But, but you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty aware that I'm six sigmas off the mean in the sense that I looked at the brain thing when Harlan opened his laptop and showed it to me, and I could immediately see using it and, and that, it, that it mapped to how I did things, and I stuck with it, and I, I've never had, like, a month where I hate this thing. I'm never going to use it again. Hasn't happened. Simply hasn't happened. Sorry, Gene. <laughs> Gene has that as a recurring episode, at least annually. Um, 
We were looking for different things. Exactly, exactly. And, and just yesterday, I was busy adding something, curating uh, something that matters to me about circular, current, uh, circular money and things like that. And I was like, I don't know how I would have such a clear representation of this thing I'm thinking about and trying to make sense of in any other tool. I, I had that thought. I was sitting there looking at it going, that's nice and crisp and clear <clears throat> and okay, next, right? Because, and, and I have, a, I'm a little bit like, you know, the, the worker bee that's down in the comb or, or maybe more the farmer ant because I, I think a lot of what I'm doing is I'm, I'm gardening a fungus, sort of like farmer ants that, that could be nutritious to a lot of people because farmer ants don't eat leaves. They eat nectar off of the fungus that they are busy uh, tending in their hives. <clears throat> right? Um, so I, I kind of metaphorically see myself as one of those little farmer ants busy in a corner, and I wish there were lots of other farmer ants and we were all busy on the fungus, but damn it, this is like good work and look, 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 and then it's satisfying because like that one little farmer ant, I can look up and go, ooh, clear drop of nectar, really nutritious, this is awesome. Right? And then I look around up and down the, the hive and I'm like, shit, where is everybody? And then I come to a call like this, or I host a call like this, and I'm like, okay, okay, here's some of the other farmer ants, and we're like all busy in our own little hives because the hives aren't connected. Um, how do we do something bigger, better out of this? Jean, go ahead. The hives are connected. There are multiple links in my brain to your brain. And vice versa. Okay. So though there, there isn't another product like the brain, is there? I mean, the uh, only the only one that I know that even comes close is debate graph, uh, and it has a different purpose. Um, well, let me actually. Um, there's it's in your brain thing. somewhere, right? Exactly. And th I, there's a different question, which is, what other what other braining um, activities are there? Uh, say that again. Well. Um, I think I, 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 an interesting question is the, the verb part of that instead of the noun part. Um, uh, so there's braining with the brain. Uh, is there wicking with wikis? Um, uh, there's, you know, I, I do something similar to, to what Jerry does with the brain, but I do it with a, a weird hodgepodge of all kinds of stuff. Um, what is What's that? What is that? Why? What is that? Or what tools? I, you know, no, that, more, no more what? No more the yeah. question is why rather than with what? Uh, uh, or, or how? What, the, what brain, is that? the brain doesn't, doesn't serve the need for some reason? Uh, for, yeah, for a couple of reasons. Um, okay. Uh, which we could go into, but it's probably not the interesting thing. I think the, the interesting question is what is the, th you know, what, what's the activity of braining? Um, and and what's, what happens with Jerry when he's doing that? And what happens with Jerry and another person when he's braining with somebody else? So. So oh, sense, sense making, the, the closest word that we've got is sense making and collaborative sense making and, and maybe, you know, a, a mashup of the word sense making and memory or something like that. I, so a, a couple of people, I, I, uh, we, we talked about the, um, the, the Vox uh, jazz thing. That's, uh, there's a Siri by Estelle Caswell. Um, and she's got this magical way of being able to, she's a video essayist. She's got this magical way of making connections through happens to be music, right? There's Maria Popova, who kind of does the same thing out of, you know, literary and cultural history. Um, uh, James Burke was the same kind of thing where mm -hmm. you can make a thread through history. So, I, sense making and and ironically there's an I, I, irony to me which is the thing that i i think the best thing that could happen to jerry's brain is that there will be sense makers uh there will be a marie popova uh or a marina amaral um in 200 years kind of taking you know a whole bunch of braining and telling a story about it in the in the um in the lexicon of the, the age, you know, mm -hmm. which is probably going to be immersive VR. Um, so, uh, um, 
So I have a thought that I've just gone to here in the screen sharing. I'm just changing its color because I'm feeling really, it's sort of important to me. Um, for a, a lot of people's lives were shaped by Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead. Um, many people point to Cosmos, uh, uh, Carl Sagan's book. Uh, a lot of people were motivated by um, the whole earth photograph that Stuart Brand basically said, asked NASA to cough up and said, hey, why haven't we seen the whole earth? What's the deal? And out of this comes Earth Day and environmentalism and a bunch of other stuff, right? And this nice article about Stuart in the New York Times, the man who changed the world twice uh, and his creation, the whole earth catalog, which influenced a whole bunch of other people, right? So, um, so in the best of, of all futures, I would love braining yes. as a verb to be on this list, Yes. right? I think that's a good aspiration for me. Uh, here's Powers of Ten, uh, Ray and Charles Eames, right? Uh, so, for, so for example, Keith Yamashita of SY Partners was inspired by Powers of Ten. Right? So sometimes when people say out loud what motivated them, I'll, I'll make that link explicit here. <clears throat> um, and I, I don't remember who Richard Foy is, but, oh, he's a guy that I met at, at the Conference on World Affairs in Boulder, which April and I are going to go to again this April. Um, and he was also inspired by Powers of Ten. So, um, so I'm really interested in this idea of braining as a verb. And, and I think braining is an instance in a class of, of other things. And so braining isn't, isn't the only interesting or it's not even the most interesting one of those necessarily. Um, and braining as I practice it is not collaborative yet. It's only collaborative in the sense that we're in a conversation and, and as, you know, Pete, as you mentioned, a couple of things I didn't have in my brain and I'm, you know, I, I, I've set aside to go uh, put Estelle in. Um, it, it's also collaborative just uh, when, when you can perform for somebody in the same way that, you know, a, um, a, a jazz musician can play for a small group or even one person. Um, there's some collaboration going on there, even though it's kind of one way. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, and when when it's when improv is working right, and when when the audience and 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 I are connected, it's re it feels really interactive. I I can feel their curiosity. They're asking great questions. It's lively. It's 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 lovely. I, I like that a lot. I, I think it probably feeds back into the way that you bring too. Yeah, that could well be. Huh. So what else does does braining mean? Gene, go ahead. The manner in which you bring. The, the relationships that you make that make sense to you are, are to an extent dependent upon all of the experience of your entire life. All right. So at, at that moment, when you form a, a mental relationship between things, it, it may be a relationship that doesn't make any sense to other people. Now, it might be, might not be, because you made it because it made sense to you and that was based upon all of your experience that other people only some of which other people have right so there's a question about when when i in other words a couple of people have been talking to me about the about the book i'm writing and and, and who the target is and and where i'm missing the target because I'm writing it from a perspective of what makes sense to me as opposed to what makes sense to the audience that I'm writing it for. And, and they're trying to get me out of my box, okay, to, to think about it from an understanding of the perspective of the target audience. And it's, and it's real difficult to get out of the box and stay out of the box. It's like, you know, the people who work in a product-oriented company have real difficulty thinking about services. Mm -hmm. They build products. Right? So it's, I think that the same thing comes into play in terms of the way that you build the relationships in your brain. So a, a couple things on that. 
Um, one is this thing I just noted here about beginner's mind, which is <clears throat> um, over the years I've developed kind of an idea that to, to do something innovative, you often need to know a lot about the history of how the thing gets done. So when the internet shows up, I, I, because I was a tech analyst for a while, I knew a lot about how the phone system worked. I knew what, what the difference was between a PBX and a Centrex and, and how, you know, how switches worked and all that kind of stuff. And the really hard thing is to know a lot about something and then try to forget enough about it that you leave enough mental space that this other thing showing up actually sounds smarter and more reasonable and, and will probably take off. Even though if you bought the philosophy of the existing regime, you would reject it out of hand, right? So I remember I was an advisor to AT&T Laboratories when Dave Nagel was in charge. I, w I went to one meeting one year and we were talking about IP telephony. I was like on a soapbox about how urgent it was and they were like, TCP IP is not designed for telephony. This is a really stupid idea. And at the next meeting, they had a voice over IP call between their Menlo Park office, their New Jersey office, and a Berlin office. And they were already late to the party and they never quite like figured it out. And, and you know, then AT&T basically gets, goes belly up and Southwestern Bell buys it as a badge and pastes it on, on the front of the company. And the current AT&T is not the old AT&T, like, like almost no remnants of it. Right, and that, that's in my brain as well, like, like Southwestern Bell and some of that legacy. And it's confusing and it, I can't, I should do the story of, you know, the, these different parts and I'd like to. But anyway, um, getting to beginner's mind is really, really hard. And that's part of what I'm trying to do with this collaborative sort of memory, collaborative sense making thing, because I'm 21 years buried in this brain thing, which has shaped my head in different ways for what I expect, how I work, what I see, what I like, what smells good, what doesn't smell good. And I realize that that's twisted my perspective on it quite a bit, I think in some ways in a good way, because I, I often am staring at a screen that's really quite clear and expresses well what, I, what I'm trying to remember or say. Um, and then the second point I wanted to make from what you just said, Gene, is when braining with people, with other people, it's kind of up to our conversation to peel back the layers of, of the onion that I have in my head around that context. So I will dive into the first obvious thing. And then if somebody else asks a question or points something out or, or looks at the periphery and says, well, what's that? I'll go there and, and try to explain. And there are tons of stories that, that most nodes in my brain, like lot, lots of directions I could go. And there's no way to download all the context and all the history I have. So this is, I, I don't mean to, this is not self-aggrandizement, but I just recently was listening to Yo-Yo Ma playing box cello concerto like one of the, the late ones, which is really kind of an abstract piece of music and it's beautiful. And he's sitting back, he's, he's leaning way back in his chair, holding his cello sort of flat against his belly. And he's playing like this. And you sense that every note Yo-Yo Ma has ever played is showing up in the thing he's playing right this second. It, it's, he, it's, he, he's right there inside of Bach's head, inside of his cello's wood. He is like, really, like you, 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 you sense it. So, that's what that's what resonated for me when you said that you know when I'm when I'm playing or Pete when you were describing how I'm braining or you know using this thing, <clears throat> I feel like well yeah it's and I'm and what I'm hoping to find is a shortcut way yeah. to explain the most important part about whatever it is I'm looking at right now. What was the insight? Because my brain as an analyst for a dozen years, my brain is trained to go to how do I crisply express the insight that I'm staring at. And so what I'm trying to do when I name things in my brain and when I make connections is tease out. I'm trying to do like a bonsai gardener does. <clears throat> I'm trying to call yeah. out the warp or twist or natural shape that we're looking at to, it, to enhance it, to make it more visible so that others might see it. And I'm clearly not succeeding that much in there because, you know, Gene, I think it's perfectly normal that you would say, hey, I'm, I'm not getting your opinion here. But, but I'm trying to do that through digital topiary. But you're too good at it, Jerry. <laughs> well, also- That's, that's I, the problem, you are too good at it. Mm -hmm. and, and really what has to be acquired is um, an equivalent sort of comfort levels. By a bunch. I can lean back, you know? <laughs> um, we, we've got to get good at this. And uh, I mean, carrying on with a sort of musical analogy, I, I'm seeing a potential emerging relationship between um, braining and cooming. Uh, mm -hmm. That um, 
it's sort of like the brain is sort of like the rhythm section. It's, it's, it's firm, it's, it lays down the pace, it makes mm. connections, it puts the pieces in. It's your, it's your moving static, if you like. Whereas the, the kuming um, in Ala uh, Jean is, um, it's very much multi-threaded, it's solos, it's cross-reference, it's, it's flow. So it would be interesting to explore um, how those two plays could interact with a, a content area that was entertaining and useful. It, it interacts very well now that I can embed Kumu projects in my brain mm -hmm. and actually have them show up in the brain. And I'm, I've, I've developed no proficiency in Kumu or many other tools. I'm, I'm very proficient in Prezi, <clears throat> which I like. So I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable in Prezi and I'm using that to, to, to do a bunch of stuff still. Um, and I do see these tools as very complementary. I see that one of the Inside Jerry's Brains calls that I want to do in, a, in the next couple of weeks, I'm waiting for Robert Best to come back from a trip, but I, I want to set three or four of us up who use different tools and to listen to the same conversation or start from the same idea, do our own version of whatever it is we're mapping from that conversation and then compare notes. Basically, mm -hmm. each do a screen share to put up the Kumu version and the Metamaps version and the Brain version and something else. Mm -hmm. Be because we're not doing the same thing exactly. Quite. And there's different kinds of value that come from those different exercises, right? Jazz. Um, yeah. And, and, and well, what we don't have yet is the jazz quartet. What we don't have is us playing off each other while doing this. Mm -hmm. We don't even have, so one thing I've offered to do at several conferences, and I've gotten to do this once um, at uh, Peter Van de Ora's uh, finance conference, whose name escapes me right now, but I can look it up. <clears throat> anyway, um, th there was a panel about the future of money, and I was sitting behind the panel. My brain was on a couple big screens ob above the panel. I did not say a word during the panel, but I had already put all the panelists in my brain, and as they talked, I was busy bringing up the topics that they mentioned, right? So if they mentioned a vendor, I brought up the vendor. If I didn't have it, I added it. I was basically... <clears throat> Comment, I was doing graphic facilitation, sort of, of a, of a sort, but in my brain during the call. It was really interesting. I'd love to do more of that. But even just putting up a projector and braining at an event mm -hmm. is a rare thing nobody's looking for. Yeah. Right? Nobody's asking for this. Not a soul. I would love to go do that. I'd be perfectly happy to attend conferences and go, you know, uh, be the brain annotator for a while. It'd be super cool. I could also do it just, you know, from my Barca lounger with a Bud Light in hand, um, it, listening, listening to a live stream. That's really easy. And they could project the results of my brain. I could screen share back. That'd be super simple too, right? Yeah. So I, I don't actually have to be physically present at the event. Which opens up a whole branding opportunity too. Yeah, yeah. Especially if I sit there with the Barca lounger and we get a good portrait of me on, with a Bud. Well, it, it's a sort of a skill, like these um, graphic artists that have proliferated over the last 10, 15 years, you know, wall charts of everything that's been talked about. Same thing, except you don't have to be present. Yeah. Um, and back, to, back to where you started about this. Cool. There are things that I do in Kumu that you cannot do in the brain. There is right. no equivalent, yeah. which is, which is why, what I finally sorted out in my mind to try and get one thing to do all of the things that I needed to do. Um, and it just doesn't work that way. So. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, and Kumar, I think, will let you set up a simulation where you have variables and you have dependencies and you have, you know, variables that have effects on other variables and you can run it as a, as a simulation. No, that's, that's Insight Maker. Ah, damn it. <laughs> Um, and, and, and we also could use, and I think this is an interesting role, we could use knowledgeable people, people who, who know a whole bunch of different tools and who the experts are, who the black belts are on using each of the tools to help people find their way to the right set of tools for the, right, for the questions that they're asking. Because mostly what happens is we get good at one thing. Most, lots of people are really good at, at Excel, for example. And we wind up just you know, bashing that tool against whatever problem shows up. Yeah, exactly. That's not so much fun. So how do we get a jazz quartet? Um, I, I, this, is, this is really intriguing to me. I'd love to do that. So, so 
suggest on the Inside Jerry's brain list, if you're interested, suggest who all we should bring together because I'm already going to invite uh, Christina Bowen, Rich, uh, Robert Best. Uh, they're both Kumo experts and so are Eugene. So we could get multiple Kumo experts. Um, <coughs> actually, sorry, Robert is actually using MetaMaps the <coughs> earlier. So we could have so we could have brain Kumu meta maps going. <coughs> if if I should add another one or two tools, let me know. So like send me send me who on the list. You can add Insight Maker, and I'll cover that one too. Okay. Fabulous. Um, and and maybe something else. But let, let's have that call and see where that goes, and and do a little compare and contrast. That'd be fun. And then before we run out of like 90 minutes, which we're sort of right on, any other thoughts now looking back on the question we started with, which is what does all this mean for my brain as a legacy and what do I write into my will? And, and, and Pete, I think I have to do a lot of things that are separate from the will yeah. in order to create a, a community that might outlast my life that would be interested in this quest and would sort of carry it forward in an interesting way. And I really love the idea of braining as a thing. And I'm now extremely inspired to create a, just a, a ton uh, of short, short video tools. Out loud on what I see, what it means to me and, and how that all works. So that all works. So what else does this mean for my, my will? I, I've got a dangling thought before we, before we go to that wrap, which is, if we rewind uh, three or four minutes, um, Michael ended up saying, you're too good at it. Um, you had said right before that, that I'm putting stuff in and trying to make an obvious connection, but it's obvious to an analyst, right? Or it's especially obvious to you. I think um, the, the picture that gives to me is um, you've made a, a parsimonious connection, a, a parsimonious representation of, of a, a larger thing. Um, and uh, again, with the music analogy, it's a lot like you've finally notated uh, a jazz passage that you've been going over. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and to an accomplished musician, an accomplished jazz musician, or maybe even somebody in a you know, classical pianist or yo-yo ma, they could pick up your notation and they would go, ah, I see what he's done here. I'm going to just follow the same thing, right? And they could actually explain, you know, this is why he did this transition. This is why, you know, the, the rhythm changes this way. For the rest of us, we're looking at a bunch of dots on, you know, on, on paper. You know, it's like, okay, I kind of see that there's some nodes and I kind of see that there's, so there's, the performance um, is, is not captured in the brain. The brain ends up being essentially, you know, the, the sheet music for an accomplished pianist that, that um, another accomplished musician could, could read and yeah. reconstitute. There's a, another really nice music video of Leonard Bernstein introducing Glenn Gould to play some Bach. And the introduction, he says, hey, look, here's the sheet music. Bach leaves no clues. And we don't have recordings. We don't have any evidence of how these things were actually played. We have a little bit of what the instruments were like of the day, so we can tell that period, period instruments would sound a little different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's just, it's like bare bones score. You have to figure out what he meant, what it means. You have to crawl inside his head, which is what Glenn Gould does too, right? Um, so, so super, super interesting to see the many ways you might express a passage and how it all hooks together and all of that. And, and then, in dance notation, this is true too. Uh, but you know, when a musician sits down with a score, when an actor sits down with a script, their notes on the score or the script are the inflections, the pauses, the the the, the crib sheets. Uh, all too often, these are probably mystical to any other person. There, a, a lot of these are personal notations that they would understand because they need to gl glimpse at it and be reminded of a much bigger thing that they've internalized already. Because th that one little hint on the score is reminding them, oh yeah, this is where I picture like there's a truck coming after me and I need to hurry up and like speed up the pace or something, right? Um, but I like that a lot. I, I added Dick Hyman, who does these amazing arrangements of, of old music. He's got an, an album called um, If Dix Did Gershwin, I think it is. Hmm. Um, He's a piano player, but he can arrange music to sound just like it it, it would have, you know, uh, in 1930. 1930. Ooh, that's cool. I've just added him to my browser to go 
hunt him down. He's not in my brain yet, but will be soon. That's Hyman and Hyphea today. That's good. Hyphea, yeah. Hyphea. I like it. Hyphea, cool. Um, any closing thoughts? Anybody? There are no closing thoughts. There are no closing. This does not have a period. No. Um, this was really um, inspiring for me and opened a bunch of new territory in my head in, in the, the onboard brain. So I really appreciate that. Um, and if you can think of a couple of IJB call topics, other topics that tumble out of this, like suggest them on the list or send me an email or whatever, I'd, I'd love to do that. I'll, I'm certainly going to do the compare and contrast, you know, different, different mind mappy tools uh, and we'll go from there. And otherwise, um, Gene and Michael, I'll probably see you in a second because we're gonna we're yes. gonna come back. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop recording this and then we can just hang out in here. Uh, no, here. no periods, just a lot more questions. Excellent. Anybody else thoughts? We're good. Thanks, Thank Al. you. Thanks, guys.